we actually continue the topic which we had for previous meetings and this was regarding the feasts for god's nation we covered a lot about the first feasts, feasts of lord and their meaning their meaning in history and their eschatological meaning their spiritual meaning we did cover a lot about how the uh, celebrations of feasts started to change even in ancient time even in ancient israel bringing more from occult practices and today we are continuing we actually stopped at somewhere early middle ages or late roman empire somewhere there and what we should cover right now i i believe you see my screen right is it shared yes okay my screen is shared okay so during Roman Empire, one more change happened, and we or, already come to the uh, era of Christianity, because previously we were discussing about ancient Israel and what was happening in times of uh, before Christ. But um, during Roman Empire, another thing which happened is a shift of New Year celebration. We shall tell that in the be very beginning of Rome, the city of Rome, the celebration of uh, New Year was in month of March. But very early, actually, the second king of Rome, Numa Pompilius, which was like 7th, 8th century BC, he changed it to 1st January. It was a, a legal change, but it wasn't very widely accepted every time, every year, and this was not very strict. During Roman Empire, when during uh, the rule of uh, Gaius Julius Caesarus, they uh, established so-called Julian calendar, the reform of calendar, it was strictly officially uh, enforced that the January 1st is the celebration of New Year. But do you remember that New Year, according to God's calendar, was uh, in spring two weeks before Passover, because it is told in book of Exodus, and we did study it uh, previously in one of our uh, first meetings, that uh, when God tells to Moses about Passover in the month of Abib, uh, he tells that this month will be the first month of the year. So, and Passover is on 14th of month Abib, late and called Nisan. So it is like uh, end of March, beginning of April. So the new year, new year, according to God's calendar, should happen like two weeks before roughly in the middle of March. Uh, of course, uh, the changes on Roman Empire are, uh, in times of Numa Pompilius, etc., didn't affect ancient Israel, but Julian calendar did affect already. And it is interesting that after Roman Empire fell, Christian approach again started to denominate, and New Year was moved again from January to March because more biblical concept, biblical vision was that New Year is in March, of course, if God himself openly tells about this. But in 1582, when the Roman Pope Gregory was uh, enforcing the reform of calendar, the reform of calendar in, besides uh, adjustment of length of the year for correction of uh, the calendar error, uh, it also encompassed the change of the celebration of New Year to 1st January from March. It is interesting also that this uh, change was not uh, the same moment established across whole Europe even, because England, for example, they didn't accept Gregorian calendar until um, middle of 18th century. The New Year in England was in March also. And only later it was accepted and they shifted also to January 1st. Interesting for me is to observe how a Roman kingdom, then a Roman empire, and then papal Rome, three times in the history, Numa Pompilius, then Gaius Julius Caesar, Julian calendar, and then Gregorian calendar in the Middle Ages, three times they established New Year on January the 1st. And we see how it drifted back to March to biblical time of New Year, but then Roman uh, Roman power returns it again to January first. I think there should be some reason for it. 
It's because it, Rome makes it three times. And uh, for, for us, for God's people, I understand that we, most of us, most of Christians live in countries where New Year is celebrated according to Roman calendar. Of course, there are countries where it is different, like in Iran, for example, or I believe in Ethiopia. Uh, another change which happens in very early Middle Ages or like very late anti ancient time in a Roman Empire period is a change of weekly day of the Lord. You know that from the very beginning of creation, the day dedicated to God every week was Shabbat. And uh, beginning of second century, uh, specifically in year 132, in Israel starts the last big Judean war, the war led by Bar Kokhba against uh, Gentiles, against Romans and Greeks, and is Israel, uh, Israeli powers were once very successful, but then they were uh, defeated by Romans. And Emperor Hadrian, who defeated uh, Jews, they outlawed uh, Judaism in whole Roman Empire. And one of instruments of outlawing Judaism and making it extremely inconvenient for Jews to live in Roman Empire was prohibiting keeping Shabbat. That's why, by the way, many Jews, they moved away from Roman Empire to Persian Empire at that moment of time. It was a uh, um, Parthian Empire at that moment, and then later Sassanid Empire. But, uh, so the, the many Jews who went to Iran and other countries, Central Asia, etc., they, they went because they were not able to leave the way of Judaism in Roman Empire. At that moment, uh, Christians in Rome make an interesting decision. Specifically, the Bishop of Rome, and I understand the Bishop of Rome is a, a Roman Pope, that's uh, the, uh, the title to change it, it's the same position. So the Bishop of Rome or early Roman Pope at that moment changed the Sabbath celebration, which was normal and usual for Christianity in that time, changed it to Sunday celebration. And uh, he, he, he changed it to demonstrate to Roman, Roman government that Christians are not Jews and they separate religion. It is interesting how in the very beginning of Christianity, we read in the book of Acts that uh, all apostles, they feel that they are a continuation of Judaism. And Jews actually tell that no, they are not ours, but uh, apostles claim that they are uh, continuation of Judaism, it's just fulfillment of the prophecies of uh, Old Testament. And now, in this time, Bishop of Rome wants to separate from inconvenient heritage of Judaism because of perils from the side of Gentile government. Probably many Christians in Rome saw, saw it as temporary measures, but quite often, temporary measures become permanent. And this thing also became pretty much permanent in Christianity. We see just a couple hundred years later, Council of Laodicea, it's already at the time when Christians did not have uh, almost any, um, any uh, persecutions or anything to be afraid of from Roman government. The Council of Laodicea was happening in 360s AD. One of canon of Council Laodicea, specifically Canon 29, reads as follows. Christians should not Judaize and be idle on Saturday. Greek Sabbath, uh, sat, uh, Saturday, that's how we translate it in the English language, but in uh, original Greek text, is it's, there is the word Sabbaton, which comes from Hebrew Shabbat. But show work on that day, but the Lord's day, they imply by Lord's Day Sunday here, yeah. they show special honor. And as being Christians, show if possible, do not work on that day. If, however, they are found Judaizing, they shall be shut out from Christ. Here we see first persecutions on Christians who hold to biblical words as contrary to the word of Bishop of Rome. And 
probably first time in history where the terminology of Lord's Day is applied to Sunday because biblically it was always applied to Shabbat. We know many places in the Bible where God tells that observe my Shabbats. So here, change of language, change of legislation by church. Interesting, uh, how in Christianity that things change it, uh, these conversations resurfaced more than a thousand years later. In the very beginning of Reformation in Europe, in 16th century, in the time of Martin Luther, there was a Council of Trent. It was held from 1545 to 1563. These people really took their time, didn't they? Spending well, like almost 20 years, like 18 years in council. They did gather uh, several times during that period of time. So of course, it, they didn't uh, have any problems with deadlines and to deliver anything quickly, as you see. So the uh, last or one of last meetings, uh, actually it was 17th session, uh, the Archbishop of Regia, Gaspar de Fosso, uh, was kind of proving that Protestants do not observe Bible. Because if you remember, the word of Martin Luther was sola scriptura, on the scripture, we based our faith on the on scripture and not on the word of church. And this uh, Catholic archbishop actually brings a proof, real proof, that Protestants are inconsistent in their claim. Look. Uh, I'm quoting from his uh, statement. The Protestants claim to stand upon the written word only. They profess to hold the scripture alone as a standard of faith. They justify the revolt by the plea that the church has apostatized. That the church has apostatized from the written word and follows tradition. Now the Protestants claim that they stand upon the written word only is not true. The profession of holding the scripture alone as a standard for faith is false. Proof, the written word explicitly enjoins observance of the seventh day as Shabbat. They do not observe the seventh day, but, re but reject it. If they do truly hold the scripture alone as a standard, they will be observing the seventh day as is enjoined in the scripture throughout. Yet they not only reject the observance of Shabbat enjoined in the written word, but they have adopted and do practice the observance of Sunday, for which they have only the tradition of the church. Consequently, the claim of scripture alone as a standard fails, and the doctrine of scripture and tradition as essential is fully established, the Protestants themselves being judges. Uh, extremely smart he uh, showed inconsistency in Protestant practice. Um, by the way, in this study on feasts of God, we will see many other inconsistencies, even for many people who observe Shabbat, but still continue celebrating uh, occult uh, feasts or feasts which are not based on the Bible, religious, but not based on, based on Bible. It's also inconsistency. So what had Protestants to tell when they heard this message? They had to tell, thank you, man. We will go and study it more. And if we do it wrong, we will, we will fix it. We will correct it. Thanks for pointing it out. They did not. Unfortunately, they continued observing the decisions of church, the decision of men instead of the word of God. Now, um, we, we covered the moment of New Year. We covered the moment of Shabbat. And another important uh, holiday, so we, we, we go ahead is a Pesach. The Pesach it happens two weeks after New Year. It is end of March, beginning of April, roughly. It is interesting for me how even Protestant, even Adventists, many, not all, but many Adventists, continue instead of Pesach or Passover, which will be correct translation into English, to tell the word Easter. Uh, the word Easter is definitely not biblical, and there is no doubt that the word Easter comes from a pre-Christian Germanic female deity, Estre. It is female deity of fertility. And those of us who remember well uh, different pagan deities mentioned in Old Testament and know uh, some pagan deities of ancient Babylonia and Assyria, uh, it's 
it cannot slip from our attention that this word, uh, name of Germanic data Istra is suspiciously similar to Astarte or Ishtar. And yeah, I, I, am, I am convinced that it's not coincidence. Many names of pagan deities across many different nations, they correlate to each other because they're all related to very, very ancient cults, which starts at the time of building the Babylon Tower or roughly of that time in Middle East. And then people spread across all earth and they carry those occult beliefs. So how did it happen? that the name of Germanic pagan deity, which uh, is related to ancient Babylonian deity, uh, came to replace the name of the feast of the God, of God and probably the first feast of God. Uh, when you look through King James translation and you see only one place that when this word Easter is mentioned in King James translation, that place in the book of Acts, chapter 12, verse 4. And it is uh, about persecution about certain apostles and, and they were put into jail and uh, how Herod wanted to, uh, or after Easter, to bring them forth to people. And the word Easter here, if you open uh, original Greek text, in Greek language, it's written Pascha. The Pascha is just a cop Greek copying uh, Hebrew word Pesach. So in original text, there is word Pesach, there is no word Easter. So this was a mistake of translation. Um, very uh, brave and uh, intelligent and brave person, person who served God a lot, William Tyndall, the person who was made first translation of Bible into English language from original text of Hebrew and Greek, because Wycliffe, Wycliffe before him was translating from Latin language. Tyndall was first to translate from Hebrew and Greek, but he made a mistake. He translated so many other places correctly, uh, translated it, actually, he coined the word Passover in English language. It didn't exist before him. He was researching, probably praying how to translate the Hebrew word Pesach. And the Pesach really means to pass by or pass over. So he created the word Passover and started to use it in his Bible translation. But in one place, he omitted it. And interesting how it slipped his attention. It stayed in one place only in whole Bible. In all other places, it, he translated as Passover. And then it came to King James Version, of course, because King James Version was based mostly on translation by Tyndall. But is it enough for us to continue naming Easter uh, instead of Passover? I don't think so. Uh, it's not only the name the whole symbolics of Easter is different. First of all, Easter is not celebrated on the same day. If you look on the calendar and you will see when Israel holidays or uh, Hebrew holidays are uh, celebrating a Passover, the Pesach or Passover, and you see the Easter, you see that Easter comes usually one week later. Uh, so it's not exact, uh, exact matching calendar. But there are more things which do not match. For example, the traditional bakery on Easter is living it. And we know from Book of Exodus that every sled, every soul which will eat living it on Pesach will be, will be destroyed. That's what God tells. Uh, even if it uh, can argue that it will not be destroyed because uh, this is an uh, old law, and we are not under that old law, etc. It's an argument to which we can go, but still we cannot tell that uh, the specifically what we do for Passover must be living it. Uh, how did it evolve? It evolved, it is very old saying. So it is definitely not the Passover bakery. Those Easter buns, how you name it? They're very old saying. They are mentioned in Old Testament. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah uh, in chapter 7, verse 18, we read, The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women need thou to make cakes to the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. 
Uh, well, the Queen of Heaven actually should sound familiar to anyone who you know about the cult of Mary in mainstream Christianity. Uh, Queen of Heaven is kind of the title which is used there. Interesting. Uh, but here in Jeremiah, Queen of Heaven is specifically related to Astarte or Ishtar, or if you want Germanic pronunciation or an English pronunciation of that word, it is Estra or Ister. It's the same. And they made the Tao and those ancient bakery, which were created, it was part of the uh, pagan tradition, actually pagan tradition of Babylonians, which Israelis accepted in the time of Jeremiah. And God tells us that it provokes me to anger. So that's where those Easter buns come from. Um, it definitely has nothing to connect it to matzot, to unleavened bread of Passover. Actually, the unleavened bread of Passover is very important. It has spiritual meaning. If we look through the calendar, we actually did study it, that on Passover, seven days, they ate only unleavened. And after that, on Pentecost, Shavuot, or Pentecost, the day 50, uh, they were making leavened bread, first leavened bread, presenting it to God. So it was a uh, change, it was a demonstration that they do not take any living from Egypt. And the only living which they have, they get it in the presence of God because the Pentecost was celebrated in, uh, before the Mount Sinai when they received God's law, God's commandments. And we know what is living, right? In, the go in gospel, when Christ tells about the word living of Pharisees and Sadducees, he, he, he explain that it is about doctrine, it's about teaching. So them not taking any living from Egypt is about we do not take any teaching of Egypt. We leave Egypt, we exit, and then we receive the teaching in the presence of God on the day of Pentecost, if you want, with uh, Ten Commandments, and later in Book of Acts with Holy Spirit. That's where we receive it. So it is very important here in the celebration of Easter, it's completely compromised. Another uh, symbolic is a rabbit. We know probably it's named, I believe in America, Easter bunny. And there is even symbolic of Easter bunny girl, right? So the whole symbolics of rabbit in the cult of Ishtar is very well known because Ishtar or Astarte or Ostre in Germanic pronunciation was a deity of fertility. And the rabbits were kind of symbolics of her because of extreme fertility also. And uh, this association of female deity of fertility with a bunny, with a rabbit, which is also like animal symbol of fertility, it came to this understanding of a girl which wears the uh, uh, decorations of uh, looking like a bunny, like a rabbit. So it's actually presenting that girl as a, a presentation of Ishtar, of Astarte. Like I don't understand how Christian parents can uh, allow or admit such thing in the life of their child, because remember, plague with occult things, open gates for demonic influences. It's not innocence game. Another symbolic, another symbolic is uh, painting X, right? Well, you see those painted X here on this picture. Uh, I believe I still share my screen. You see those painted X. You know about the practice of painting X on Easter, uh, which is, yeah, there are many games about that, etc. But you definitely see that those X on this picture, painted X, they're definitely not American, right? The all, all decoration and even the alphabet in which it is written in the uh, in the egg which is in the center is definitely not English language, right? Well, of course, it is from Iran. This is a decoration of eggs, painting eggs on so-called Novruz Bayram. Uh, I know it very well because I'm from Azerbaijan. My country is next to Iran, and not only Iran but all area which is under Iranian cultural influence and cultural influence of Iran is enormous. It's a huge culture in every dimension, like huge poetry, like lots of celebrations uh, of different kinds and well, big culture. Yes, yeah, so Central Asia, Caucasus, uh, Iran, Iraq, or part of Turkey, like, oh, big territory, Afghanistan, they're under uh, influence of Iranian culture. They all know the things. 
the decoration of eggs and painting them. So if this thing is not Christian, it is even and in Iran actually, or in Azerbaijan, we recognize that it's not Muslim also. It comes from pre-Muslim times and it comes from pre-Christian times. It comes from times of pagan worships. And to both modern Christianity and to this area of uh, Central Asia and Middle East, it came from the same source. It came from Babylon. Painting X was a symbolic of Babylon cult of Ishtar. And again, it's related to the cult of fertility. So it is not, had nothing to do with Passover. Why there are so many different symbols? It is obvious that many different, the, all different symbols and even different day, it's not exactly the same day. Yes, it's one week different because it is celebration of a resurrection, not of Christ. More specifically, that cult of Ishtar was celebrated in celebration with the resurrection of our son, Tammuz. And Tammuz was an ancient Babylonian deity, which it was killed and resurrected. So this is resurrection, not of Christ. It is replacement of Christ with somebody else. And um, the cult of Tammuz from very ancient time was introduced as a cult of false messiah to replace uh, uh, to replace worship to Christ, even before Christ came to this earth uh, 2,000 years ago. That's how it was. Uh, by the way, biblical Passover is not a day of resurrection. Uh, on Passover, Christ did not resurrect. Christ died on Passover. He resurrects three days later on, the, and on another feast, on the feast of wave sheaf. You know, remember, we, we studied all those uh, holidays. Yes, yeah? so the Feast of Wave Sheep celebrated three days after Passover, and it's given so in Old Testament and it, as a picture of what will happen in Christ, that he will die on Passover and three days later he will resurrect. So Pesach is not day of resurrection. It's day of death. So it's completely different picture. It's everything is messed. What about false Messiah again, about Tammuz? Well, you see this picture? So. On the right side, you probably recognize that is an uh, iconic pictures of uh, Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox Christianity. Uh, it is a picture of Mary with baby Christ on hands. It's very, very popular uh, type pattern uh, of images in Christianity, both Eastern Christianity and Western Christianity. But in the middle, you see uh, pictures which are ancient Mesopotamian, and it de de depicts Semiramis with Nimrod, or uh, Ishtar with Tammuz. Actually, uh, if you go studying more about those pagan deities, it, you, you will see how many uh, those of those patterns repeat with different names because uh, different nations were changing. Even in Mesopotamia, there were many different nations. They were changing. There were Babylonians, there were Armenians, there were Assyrians, there were Sumerians even before there were Akkadians. And, but the religious cults, uh, the patterns of religious cults, they stayed the same. So some details may change, the names change all the time, but the patterns are the same. So in the center, you see that ancient Mesopotamia, by the way, on the left side, another picture on the left side, you, you see that it's definitely Egyptian, right? That's the picture of sun, uh, symbol of sun on the head. It is Egyptian symbolic. And yes, this is actually, uh, this is uh, Isida with Hor. That is two Egyptian deities, but the same model of uh, mother uh, deity and son deity. So this was mirrored to Christianity. And this Hor or Tammuz or Nimrod in different uh, pagan cults, different names, it was copied like a mirror into Christianity and replaced worship of Christ. Mm. It should scare us how the whole uh, worship to Messiah changes through the history with false Messiah. From ancient time, cult of Tammuz was promoted a lot. And uh, interestingly, it continues to be promoted in mainstream Christianity. For example, such thing as Lent. Uh, Lent is a, a type of, it's a fasting on calendar in some denominations of Christianity. But uh, look, 
this fasting goes right before the Easter. And there was the same fasting in ancient Babylonian uh, practice calendar, 40 days fasting before the celebration of Easter and resurrection of Tammuz. Uh, we, we see it in Ezekiel, book of Ezekiel chapter eight, verse 14. Ezekiel eight fourteen. I read, then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house which is towards the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Weeping for Tammuz was one of religious activities of the cult of Tammuz because Tammuz was killed tragically and then 40 days of fasting and weeping was leading to the celebration of Easter, which was resurrection of Tammuz. And uh, during those weeping, they either were fasting completely or they had a partial fast actually in ancient Assyria, I believe they had a practice of fasting when they ate only fish, but they did not eat meat uh, and they, they did drink water. That's how the, their fast was very different from biblical fast, which is complete abstinence from any food or drink. Um, it is often told by Christians that the fast of Lent of 40 days is in commemoration of fasting of Jesus. And let me point now actually that the fasting of Jesus happened in completely different uh, time of year in calendar way. But by the way, another thing which I wanted to mention here, though we'll come to that later, that one of symbols of premature tragic death of deity Tammuz was cutting down a young evergreen tree as a way of commemorating the death. Tammuz or Nimrod, again, as I told them, those names change and uh, those things get complicated in those pagan uh, cults because of changing of nations. But the cult of cutting down a young evergreen tree and decorating it and celebrating something with it, it kept through all those occult religions and it somehow crawled into Christianity into Christian church. We will talk about that later. But right now, what about fast of Jesus, right? Fast of Jesus, um, there is one major fast in Bible and the most important fast, it is fast of Yom, Ter uh, Yom Yamim Noraim. It goes from Yom Teruah to Yom Kippur. Okay, let, let me tell you. Yamim Noraim is translated usually as days of awe. And Yom Teruah is a, a day of trumpets, is a feast of trumpets. And Yom Hakipurim or Yom Kippur, it's a day of uh, judgment. Uh, so between uh, feast of trumpets and uh, Yom Kippur, there are 10 days. And those 10 days are days of a very serious fast in uh, biblical teach, uh, teaching in general. This fast was well known. So there are many other fasts, of course, but if if Bible mentions just fast without any explanation, it's definitely like everybody knows that that is this fast. This is fast in seven months of calendar. It's roughly in October, uh, end of September probably, or October somewhere there. And it's there 10 days before Yom Kippur because the preparation to Yom Kippur is very important think it's very dangerous and th that's a day when you the, and not only you the whole nation is freed from sin because the sin is removed from sanctuary from the temple uh, for example in book of acts chapter 27 we see mentioning of the fast as uh, a mark of a certain time of a calendar acts 27 9 uh, luke writes now, when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast now already passed, Paul admonished them. So the, the, he told about one of their journey through sea in a ship through sea. And he tells that the, there was already bad time for navigation because fast passed, so which means that they were already in October or uh, I don't know, end of October probably, and late November. And that's, yeah, we know that that is time when Eastern Mediterranean part 
uh, and Western also, by the way, has more, uh, many tempests. And we know in the Book of Acts that it really happened. They did, uh, they did sail into tempest, and there were big problems because of that. So fast is mentioned here that we know that is Yamim, uh, the fast of Yamim Naraim. It is 10 days before Yom Kippur. But this is 10 days, you will tell me. Jesus did fast 40 days. Yes, I have answer to that. Actually, there was another person who before Yom Kippur fasted not 10 days, but 40 days. That person was Moses. Uh, according to a uh, chronological uh, study of uh, Torah, uh, of uh, uh, Exodus, Numbers, we can re reconstruct certain milestone in time on that first year after Exodus. And on that milestone, we see that when Moses was after, uh, you, you remember Shavuot, the Pentecost, the, uh, God gave 10 commandments, then Moses fasted, prepared, went to the mountain, spent time on the mountain, received uh, law of God and received the plan to build the sanctuary. He come. And God then tells to him that you should come down because people sin, they made the golden calf. He comes down, he destroys the golden calf, he destroys the Ten Commandments, the two tablets also. Then um, he fasts again. And then he goes again to mountain and he receives a replacement of the tablets of Ten Commandments. So uh, if you restructure, if you lay out all this timeline, you will see that he went, uh, th that, that is a 40 day period from the first day of month Elul to Yom Kippur. So it's roughly January, right? I understand. So, uh, so not January, it's roughly September, something like that. Um, their months do not really match our months. There is always overlap, and especially if they're lunar solar calendar it's not exact match always so but before so it is 40 days before yom kippur that is a time when moses fasted in order to receive 10 commandments again the replacement of the tablet in order to receive from god the renovation a confirmation of god's law and also of god's favor to the nation of israel in general so that is a 40 days fast. And that is what is, the, when the fasting happens to Jesus, Jesus actually fasts pretty much also to receive the special mission from God for saving this people. He passes through the same thing for which Moses passed. And it is, it convinces me that it should be this time of period of uh, 40 days before Yom Kippur. And, uh, I believe we are out of time already. So I understand that we do not finish now and we'll cover other changes to pra uh, practicing or celebrating God's feast and, conditions, uh, and uh, conditions which follow and consequences. We'll discuss that later, next time.